the back, we have a lot of people still coming in, and we're trying to move some chairs from other parts of the library so everyone has a place to sit. So we will get started in just a few minutes. Thank you. so much uh, for being here tonight and uh, uh, really pleased to be able to be a part of, of, of this event and I want to thank everybody from KU Libraries for organizing this. This is a kind of, um, this is a kind of, of um, event, not the one that we're here at tonight, but the one that's happening up on the Missouri River that makes you feel like you should be anywhere but the library, right? Uh, but so it's nice to be uh, in the library uh, tonight feeling as though we're doing something uh, constructive, something useful, something important, uh, learning something, uh, and uh, being able to, to take this uh, away from the library. Although I should say, as somebody who loves libraries, this is actually one of the best places to come if you want to understand what's going on up on the Missouri River, because uh, it's not as though you can go turn on um, CNN or MSNBC uh, or Fox News or any of the other news outlets that uh, most of us have available to us to find out what's happening, right? And so we're not getting the sort of uh, media stream, the best media stream I've been finding is on Facebook. Um, 
is on um, uh, Brenda Norell's Accenture News, uh, on, uh, which is on Blogspot. Um, uh, and uh, so many of those things uh, point us to the library to come looking for the kind of public information that we can get. And it's great that the library be a, a, an open space like this where uh, people can share information and to hear from people. Uh, and I guess we're a living library today, although libraries are always living, the librarians will tell us. So I appreciate all the, 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 the people at KU Libraries for, for making this possible. Uh, I just want to take a, a, a little bit of time this afternoon to say a, a couple of things. Um, everything I say today, my class is here, um, so I'm not really sharing necessarily uh, my own uh, my, my, my own opinions here. I'm really trying to pass along information. Other people who aren't teaching class along with being here to teach in, maybe wanting to share more of, of exactly what they believe, what they think. Um, uh, uh, I want to share a couple of things to give a little bit of, of context uh, and to uh, and to. Um, uh, to point out, I think, I guess just to jump right in is to say it seems to me that, that the one thing to realize about what's happening up at Standing Rock, what's happening um, uh, in the camps along the Missouri, that there are at least two things happening, or two main things happening at the same time. And one of those I want to talk about in one way having to do with the, uh, with the the constitutional, U.S. constitutional aspects of what's happening, the legal aspects of what's happening, the rights of uh, the rights of the Standing Rock Lakota people, uh, the Standing Rock Nation, uh, in relationship to the U.S. and within international law, to try to understand a little bit of that context first of all in a really brief little mini constitutional law uh, lesson. Uh, and I'm not on the law faculty, as you'll be able to see. Uh, I am, by the way, on the Indigenous Studies. Program faculty, which is fairly recent, I just wanted to, to, to jump in and say that uh, I'm really proud to be a part of part of that group here at KU. Um, the other thing I want to do after that, though, is to talk about I think the other thing that's happening, which doesn't have nearly as much and sometimes not anything at all to do with the U.S. Constitution. Uh, that doesn't really have anything to do with the legalities as much as it has to do with the relationships. Uh, uh, and the, the kinship that we see happening in those camps, not just between people, uh, but between all of the different persons who are there, including the river, including the place, including the camps themselves. Uh, and I think that that's an important aspect of what all of us can learn as we watch what's happening. And it's a part of, I think, for many of us, a way that we need to change our consciousness about, about what's happening in the indigenous world. Uh, and to approach those issues in a way that helps us to work through whatever romantic fantasies we might have about the relationships of people, especially indigenous people to the environment, uh, to work through the, the expectations we have and that we may not know that we have about what those relationships are and to really allow ourselves to think about those events in ways that help us to see not people relating to a uh, to a to a, a former historical relationship they might have had with the world around them but that these are people I think in many important ways who are pointing towards the future, towards a, a future kind of relationality uh, and kinship uh, uh, with, with the world around them. So I want to just jump into the, to maybe the, the easier part of this. Um, so I just wanted to bring up one thing that I think is missing from a lot of the news coverage, and this will maybe help contextualize things for what's, uh, what's to come from other speakers. One thing I'm not really hearing in the news coverage when I hear about the North Dakota governor saying the North, the North Dakota uh, is going to do this or that, uh, when I hear uh, when I hear about different jurisdictions who are coming in and intervening up uh, at Standing Rock, is that I'm not hearing the context that goes all the way back to the United States Constitution of the Commerce Clause uh, that sets up the relationship that the United States understands itself to have with indigenous people. Now this isn't, this isn't the limit of what that relationship is or could be or should be, 
between the United States and indigenous people, but this is the United States self-understanding in its most foundational uh, uh, founding document as to what that relationship is. Uh, this is a this is now a part of the Constitution debated um, uh, uh, in other parts of United States society about the overreach of the federal government and the states' rights, but uh, it's a very important aspect of the relationship of indigenous governments in the United States to the United States government. You can see the Commerce Clause, which you all read, you may not have noticed it as you read it, that, uh, that, it, that, Congress, that Congress has the right, according to the U.S. Constitution, to regulate commerce with foreign nations among the several states and with the Indian tribes. Uh, the main place you can see this is to drive your car off I-70. You can see you're on the interstate, right? Uh, and that when you're on the interstate, you're on a system of roads that are part of the United States saying, look, it may be that Kansas wants to have a road that goes from uh, Kansas City up to uh, Waukegan, um, but we're going to actually have a road that goes from New York all the way out to San Francisco. And there's gonna be a big road that can take all the big trucks and things that we wanna have along that. Uh, so that that's part of what the Commerce Clause actually governs, is it says, Congress is the one that's going to step in and say, we're gonna build the big roads. Uh, we're also gonna be the ones that negotiate treaties with England or with Russia, with China. Uh, and the third part of this, that's also the really important part that usually gets dropped out, is that Congress has the right, according to the Constitution, to uh, maintain relationships with, uh, with uh, uh, American Indian tribes and people. So uh, this, this, I think, is an important part when we hear about the different jurisdictions that are getting involved with what's going on on the river up there. Uh, this is an important thing that's left out, which is really that this has not been overturned uh, in, except by erosion through various sorts of U.S. laws. Uh, the important one I wanted to bring up comes from 1953, uh, Public Law 280, uh, which was preceded uh, by a couple of years uh, with six states taking, uh, being given essentially by US, the U.S. Congress jurisdiction over uh, criminal law uh, across these states, including in American Indian communities within American Indian jurisdictions. Uh, this was done without consultation with the American Indian nations who were involved uh, and was later on through PL 280 then, states could then petition to have the same, uh, could, could, could do the same thing in Oklahoma or Kansas or other places. Uh, this has since been, uh, this has since been codified in various Supreme Court decisions, uh, but all of these are to a certain, uh, to a certain point of view, all of these are eroding the certain fundamental right of American Indian people to have jurisdiction within their own lands and their own territories, their own homeland uh, over, uh, uh, over, uh, what happens in those territories, um, in this case, especially the criminal jurisdictions. Uh, so I, I wanted to point these two things out as, as something that's, um, uh, I wanted to point these two laws out and then to say as well, the harder part in the last 25 seconds of what I wanna say, that's the one side of all of this. I think it's really important as we start to see various events unfold, uh, that the jurisdictions are in question, that people are buying for, uh, their own right to do this, that, or the other thing. But that that Commerce Clause for the U.S. I think still is still standing there, uh, staring down the assertions of the governor of North Dakota and other people to say that they have a right to intervene in certain ways. Uh, the reason why, going all the way back to the Constitution and through all those years, that these things were done in the way they were was because the states could not be trusted to, uh, to uh, exercise power uh, in indigenous communities without things going terribly wrong. Uh, and I think it's one of the great fears of what's happening now. The other part of this I'm gonna leave for others because I've used up all my time in the constitutional law section of this. But I do think it's really important to, to recognize this other part of what's going on at Standing Rock. I think it's the part that's attractive to so many of us, uh, which is that people are looking for a, new, uh, looking for a way to express a relationship that they have with the river up there, with the people who are there, that that doesn't create the same sort of hierarchy that most of us are used to, because somehow we have a right to the water. 
and that the water doesn't have a right in and of itself, that the water in the river is maybe a different person than the river itself, that the riverbed as well has a certain kind of personhood. I think all of this brings up these really, uh, uh, it's sort of a minefield of romanticism, unfortunately, to bring this up, but I think it's an important part of what's happening. And that, that people learn step by step, person by person, uh, day by day, to be able to have that kind of kinship and relationship with a world around them that, 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 that is changing, that grows stronger, uh, that, that grows different uh, as, uh, as, as those relationships grow. Uh, and I guess my, my suggestion in that regard before I turn things over is to say, listen for that as you're hearing what's going on not to the news, but to the people who are there, to the people who've been there for a long time, uh, to the people who speak from the point of view of being, uh, being really experienced, an experienced part of, of that uh, uh, Lakota, Dakota uh, world. Uh, that, that's their world and those are their relationships. And I think they're describing them beautifully right now through their actions and through their words. And I encourage people to listen to that. Thank you. So where do we begin? And um, <coughs> that's always a tough decision, but since we just observed Thanksgiving holiday, I thought, well, maybe that's a good place to start. <laughs> you know, it's always good to, to have something that has a little bit of humor, but this is humor with, with fight, so we can maybe that's a, a non genre in itself. But um, you know, it's something that we can kind of smirk at, but it has real social commentary to it. Now this isn't meant to be a a divisive kind of illustration here. This is meant to say, you know, it's us or them, it's one side or the other. But I think it does help to understand and illustrate a, a pattern, a long history of colonialism and competition for resources that is echoed in, in what we're seeing today. So just kind of at a glance, thinking about the United States stepping in to the, the shoes of, of European nations that were the colonial forebears, um, if we move to about the middle of the, the 19th century, we see that the United States is expanding um, in, in pretty um, severe ways or with severe consequences. And I just listed a few things. You know, the Manifest Destiny idea was not a new one in 1845, but when John L. O'Sullivan coined that term in 1845, he kind of breathed light into something that was, um, you know, it already had some organic force to it. And we see in the Mexican War, for instance, um, um, a great example of that, or a, a, a clear example of that, um, where the United States is expanding unapologetically. The Homestead Act that, um, that President Lincoln signed into law during uh, the Civil War would be another example. Bringing more and more new peoples 
out into the land already occupied by indigenous people. And of course, all of that, and even going back further, is sprinkled through with policies like Indian removal, with warfare, with resistance, and um, with reservation policy. And when we think about the 19th century, the railroad is probably the biggest example of economic disruption cutting through uh, the plains and eventually Indian Transcontinental Railway by 1869. So those are just a few key examples to kind of again contextualize you know, what's, uh, what's happening. Um, the next two things to kind of get us more specifically to uh, what we're thinking about now with um, the Dakota Access Pipeline are these treaties that were signed between uh, the Sioux Nations and of the United States. These two Fort Laramie treaties, the first one in 1851, which established rights for natives and newcomers both as new people are passing through the West, particularly in the wake of the discovery of gold of California in 1849. And with the Sioux retaining a very large swath of land that actually crosses into what would eventually be five different states, um, about 5% of uh, the total a territorial landmass of the United States at that time. Um, this was uh, an agreement that allowed for some encroachment by outsiders, but also ensured rights to native peoples so that they would receive annual payments for 50 years of the agreement um, after that date um, as kind of a, um, an exchange for letting people pass through. Uh, their land because it was violated the very next year and the 50 years was reduced to 10 and there was a lot of discontent. I'll just comment briefly on the 1868 treaty um, which creates the what was then called the Great Sioux Reservation and you can see that, that that territory although they're not in scale to one another but has been greatly reduced. Um, that's in the wake of a, a whole bunch of other treaty violations uh, creating further tensions and hostilities uh, on the northern plains. Um, particularly that was true after gold was discovered in the region itself in, in the 1870s. Um, but it still allowed the Sioux to retain sovereign rights, especially over the Black Hills, and it caused a lot of factionalism among Dakota, Lakota, and Nakota, and Nakota peoples as they reckoned with these new policies and these new peoples. Um, part of the problem was with treaty violation, it made Native peoples somewhat dependent upon the government to supply them with these annual payments or with annuities and other forms like food in particular. So starvation and discontent were rampant in the wake of these violations. And um, in that context then this great Sioux uprising occurred, which some of you are probably aware of, many others of you perhaps not, resulting in the largest mass execution in American history, the day after Christmas in 1862. When you think about Lincoln as the, the great emancipator and the great equalizer, um, again, this happened during, during his administration. Kind of winnowing this down further and going back a little bit from the 1868 treaty again, a massacre occurred not far from where people are encamped today, at a place called Whitestone. And this happened in September of 1863. It was an attack on an encampment of mixed band of the Sioux. And Brigadier General Alfred Sully, on a punitive expedition, attacked this camp of Indians who were preparing for winter and had provisions of perhaps 300 teepees and several hundred thousand pounds of buffalo meat that they had secured for the winter. As many as 300 people, I'm not sure exactly how many, but as many as 300 people, perhaps more, were killed in this massacre, really a series of massacres. And that rivals it with the, the much better known or equally infamous uh, Wounded Knee Massacre. Um, many of the slaughtered were women and children because men who were away from the camps were continuing to hunt and bring in provisions. 
and winter's setting in at this time, so it's, it has these people at a very um, precarious position to begin with. After the massacre itself and kind of the, the mop-up, um, the property of the natives was all burned. Survivors were taken as prisoners of war, sometimes for many years. And again, to think about the context, 4,000 soldiers were sent out to do this work. That was the largest force of the United States Army ever set against Native people. It's clearly an exercise in signaling U.S. military strength and a commitment to corral and defeat these people. One of General Sully's interpreters, Samuel Brown, called this a perfect massacre, even though the Army continued to say that it was a battle or a series of battles. And here you have two perspectives. The one you just saw, what you have there on the left is a pictograph that represents the native perspective of the beginning of this uh, attack. It's um, drawn by a guy named Richard Cottonwood, and it was done 50 years after the massacre, but it was done at the direction of Texas Shield, who was a survivor of the events of 1863. And then over here on the right, you have um, an artist illustration of white stone that appeared in Harper's Weekly Magazine, uh, October 31st, 1863, under the caption, The Battle of White Stone Hill. So very different perspectives on this. Again, with the discovery of uh, gold in the Black Hills in 1874, the U.S. government sent in further expeditions, including most famously the Custer Expedition, to survey what was going on, and that prompted an attempt by the United States government to buy the rights to the Black Hills, um, and the Sioux completely refused to even come in and discuss that. It also increased outsider presence with gold being discovered there. And all of this culminated in a series of battles um, with the greasy grass, or the little big horse, in 1876. All of this took place under President Grant's so-called peace policy, by the way, and, and each of these components are kind of like separate history lessons on their own, I know, but I'm trying to, to plug in some pieces for you to think about and take away from here. You can do some research on your own. Grant's peace policy was a massive failure, and some have argued it was even intentionally foiled by his administration. The next two slides, I, I'm not going to read them to you. I'm just going to let you look at them. But I wanted to give the perspective of a couple of, of Native people, contemporary Native people, to thinking about you know, what has happened and what is happening. And with Donna Rachel Allard, I think, is an amazing historian. And she speaks about the water as the source of life in history and identity for Native people at Standing Rock. And she talks here about the, the river being um, killed, in a way, earlier. It killed a portion of our sacred river back in the 50s under the auspices of, of making a dam. I know I'm running out of time. And then here she says, you know, if we allow an oil company to dig through and destroy our history that our ancestors are hard to control, is that not genocide? We have no choice but to stand up. And then, um, some of you are aware of this, uh, this black snake prophecy. The black snake, perhaps in the 19th century, was the railroad encircling, cutting through, and um, squeezing out the life of the people. And here we have that, again, in terms of the pipeline. Uh, the pipeline that um, was threatened to contaminate primary source of drinking water damage, indigenous burial grounds, of course, villages that had sundown sites. And the only way to defeat this snake is if all of the groups, the bands of the two, can do it together. So I'll leave it there, and I'll just say all of this by way of you take it to all together, and you have a timeline of over a century and a half of concerted land seizures, resource appropriation, cultural destruction, and violence. And that's all happening right now. It's the same thing. Historians take the long view. But we have to take that too. We have to confront these things. It's not a matter of trying to feel guilty about it. It's not a matter of these romantic notions that Dr. Warrior referenced. But it's a matter of thinking about the context and the meaning 
of these moments in the past, in the present, and in the future, and how they all live together. Okay? Thank you. up at Standing Rock. How did we get to this moment? That is what I want to highlight. Um, so I will briefly, the rundown will be the Fort Laramie Treaties, the Winters Doctrine that came out of the Supreme Court case Winters versus the United States, and the Pick Sloan Missouri Basin Plan. Those are the antecedents. Those are what led up to why we are in this situation now. So following the lead of my Haskell colleague, Dr. Anderson, so 1851, the first Fort Laramie Treaty, also known as the Horse Creek Treaty, was signed by the United States and representatives of the Arapaho, Arikara, Assiniboine, Cheyenne, Crow, Hidatsa, Mandan, and Sioux Nations with the the goal to guarantee safe passage, of, safe passage of settlers to California in exchange for goods and services, not to give up land. 19, 1868, the second Fort Laramie Treaty guaranteed the Sioux Reservation land, including the Black Hills and hunting rights in Montana, Wyoming, and South Dakota. Again, that was a treaty signed by the Sioux Nations and the United States and was ratified by the U.S. Congress. It's, it's law. 1889, the United States violates the 1868 Fort Laramie Treaty by breaking up the Great Sioux Reservation into five smaller reservations. As my colleague, Professor Anderson noted, the action of placing people on reservations created this devastation and lack of access to food sources. It was a time of starvation, um, loss of hunting, hunting land, loss of access to game, to all sorts of things. People were under great stress. Um, so then we move up to 1908, and the Supreme Court case Winters versus the United States. The Winters case involved ranchers in Montana who shut off access to the Milk River um, to irrigate, irrigate their lands, um, which obstructed water flow to the Fort Berthold Reservation and the Grobant and um, uh, the Assiniboine tribes. It went to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court ruled that Indian reservations have water use rights that cannot be blocked through other projects such as irrigation or pipelines or anything else. The Winters Doctrine says that 
Indian reservations have access, have the use and control of their water. The next major historical moment on this timeline is the Pitt Sloan, Missouri Plan, 1944. This was a massive water infrastructure pro project meant to increase hydropower navigability along the Missouri River and its tributaries, and also to avoid flooding downstream into farmlands. The great Sioux Nation leaders and tribal members were unaware of this plan until it had already been approved. Now, the scholar Michael Lawson, who has done two books on this subject, indicates that the Bureau of Indian Affairs was fully informed, yet made no objections to the plan while it was being debated in Congress in 1944. The Army Corps of Engineers was so confident that it could acquire the Indian land it needed through powers of federal eminent domain that it began construction on the dams, including those actually on reservation property, even before opening formal negotiations with the tribal leaders. That is vitally important to the situation at hand. Federal eminent domain has been used not only on Indian reservations, but also the city of New London, Connecticut, where through various means, the, feder the federal government and private developers can come in and say like, okay, we want this section of land. Um, we are going to take it under this legal means of eminent domain, and there's nothing people can do about it. It happens more often on Indian land and in minoritized and poverty-stricken uh, areas. So the legislation that established the Pig Sloan Plan also ignored the Great Sioux Nation's water rights under the Winter Doctrine, which is how we got to this point where we are now. It's a violation not only of the treaties, but also of federal water law. So where Standing Rock sits, where this is happening on the Missouri River, is at a near Lake Oahe, which is the part of the river and the name, this lake was created it's not a natural lake, it was created through the Pitt Sloan Plan. So it was created through that federal eminent domain process. <coughs> that is the body of water that the pipeline company wants to tunnel underneath. So that dam, when it was originally built, destroyed more native land than any other water project in the U.S. It eliminated 90% of timberland on the Standing Rock Sioux Reservation, along with grazing and agricultural land. And it all, all, also flooded homes on the reservation, cemeteries, community buildings, ceremonial grounds, burial grounds, and areas that were the growing places for medicinal and ceremonial roots and plant life and other food bearing plants such as berries, brambles, um, other food sources. And there are also, the undergrowth is also places where small game and birds nest and, t and, and live. So that the the building of that dam in the 40s, 50s, did away with access not only to the river, but also to food sources and medicinal plant and ceremonial plant sources. So now we're here we are in 2016, and we wonder, or some people may wonder, why is everyone at Standing Rock so upset? That is why it's a violation of treaties, it's an ignoring federal water law and all these other things that happen to people who live on Standing Rock. Your homes flooded, 
your sanitary flooded, your community building flooded. People can't go back to their houses because they're underwater now. And now it's happening all over again. Someone else wants to come to the same place and do the same thing again. So, no gravel, that's all I have to say. My students who are here, and uh, Dr. Wildcat will be surprised. Dr. Wildcat and I have taught before. Uh, this is, these are the only words I have in my whole set of slides here. And this is it. So as a geographer, not an atmospheric scientist, even though I'm in a combined department, I'm not going to talk about clouds, but I'm going to talk about maps today. And maps may seem like an archaic thing in this century, you know, it's so 1995 to talk about maps. Um, doesn't my smartphone tell me everything I need to know about maps? Um, maybe not. Uh, Bernie Nietzscheman, a uh, geographer who, just a quick story about Bernie, he was actually a biogeographer. He, he studied turtles and he studied biodiversity. And then as he traveled the world, he realized, hey, all of the really great biodiverse places on the planet are lands that are owned and managed by indigenous peoples. There must be something to this. I better study this. And then he changed his complete track and started working with and figuring out how to get more native peoples in control of their lands and managing their resources. So this quote by Bernie, I, I love and have used many times. More indigenous territory has been claimed by maps than by guns, and this assertion has its corollary. More indigenous territory can be reclaimed and defended by maps than by guns. So why is it important for us to know about maps and how maps have been used to take land in this country? As this gift goes through, we can see all of these pieces of land being dispossessed. Um, from indigenous peoples on this continent. And this process, of course, has happened not only in North America and the United States, but in South America, Australia, New Zealand, parts of uh, Europe as well. And this dispossession was always methodical and always led to the transfer of a title of land and control over the resources associated with that land base. In 1946, the United States had just won a world war. Well, we had some help. But we had just won a world war, and we were putting Nazis on trial in, in Germany, in Nuremberg, for a genocide they had committed there. And lo and behold, some of those Nazis said, hey, we learned this from you. We got our best ideas from you guys. And so the U.S. government said, hey, we're going to put them on trial. Maybe we should clean up our own act, and we should actually explore um, how we've treated the Native people in North America. So this map shows the lands that were judicious, judicially <coughs> determined by the U.S. government 
under the Indian Land Claims Commission between 1946 and 1978 to have been lands that were illegally claimed by the government and transferred without the consent uh, or no and or knowledge of the people who controlled this territory um, at the time. I want you to sort of keep this map in mind as we move forward. As Dr. Anderson showed us earlier, here are a series of maps overlaid on top of each other, showing the 1851 uh, treaty territories as the unceded Indian territory, the Great Sioux Nation, and the current reservations. Here is the protest area along the river, clearly within the territory of the first treaty of Fort Laramie. Here we have the current uh, pipeline route. If you remember back to that map I showed you before, almost the entirety of this pipeline route is on territory that has been determined by the federal government to be lands illegally taken from Native people. Now, the government gave the tribes the right to a certain amount of money in exchange for those lands, uh, usually in the range of a half a cent to two cents per acre, uh, being determined the value of the land at the time they were illegally taken. Many of the tribes have thus refused to take the land, all of the Sioux uh, being a part of that agreement not to take land not to take money for their land. Here's another map showing the route that the pipeline was originally to take. And does anybody know why it didn't take this route to begin with? And why it was moved? Yes, Bismarck, the city of Bismarck was concerned about their water being affected by this pipeline. And so instead, they moved it to a location where the impact would be on the reservation's water supply instead of the city of Bismarck. So I've shown you a series of maps. They're all in the Western tradition. And I guess the thing I want to say in ending my short presentation today is it's important for us to remember that we all have geographic and cartographic traditions in our own communities, um, that our maps can be preservation of our culture and represent our worldview, and that they don't have to be in the tradition that we commonly teach over in Lindley Hall, but they can actually help to protect our cultures and our languages and ways of life. Thank you. been a treaty that the United States government has made with indigenous people that they haven't violated. We can stipulate that as a fact. There's no debate about that. Let's stipulate another fact, that the United States government will most likely continue to pass laws and act through Congress, um, policies, implement programs that infringe limit, bind the sovereignty of the First Nations, the First Peoples of this land. I don't think we should expect anything's going to change radically overnight. 
That's what makes Standing Rock and Standing with Standing Rock so important. Um, treaties, laws, maps. Great presentation on maps. I think the one thing I'd like to share and, and the first thing I'd like to do is thank all of you in this audience uh, who've been okay to Standing Rock, who've been to the Sacred Stones camp, who've been up there on the river. Could I see people just stand up? If you've been up there, would you please stand? Really? There's another thing I want to stipulate. The core of what's happening in many respects is an honoring of the power of womanhood, of the feminine, of the sacred on this planet. And it's not by accident that it's women who have been in many cases up there doing the heavy lifting. Thank you, sisters. Thank you, Jim. Robert mentioned, you know, we can get away from the hierarchy. Well, maybe we can get away from the patriarchy, too. Maybe we can get away from... There's a lot of baggage that we carry that we can get away from. And that's what's exciting about Standing Rock. Yeah, let's stand with Standing Rock. What does that mean? What does that mean? And I know some of you are, are going like, yeah, I really, I want to be up there. I've had students all semester, you know, say, gee, I feel like I want to be up there, but you know, I've got to be here. My family's made sacrifices. I'm here at school. I said, well, that's important too, being at school. Because this resistance, this act of guardianship, of protection, is not about up there along the river. It's right here in Lawrence, Kansas. It's in Kansas City, it's in Topeka, it's in Seattle. It's everywhere. Water is life. That seems so trivial, so, so simple. But that's what's being threatened. So what I'd like to do is honor and I'm going to go in that dangerous place Robert Moore, you know, warned us about. <coughs> that dangerous place to, what would it be like if people in the United States who were very dissatisfied with the institutions they move through daily, that's the other good news about Standing Rock. If you look at any picture of Standing Rock, there are a lot of descendants of the settlers of the United States standing side by side with native people. Why are they doing it? Because they know this system isn't working. Yes, look at, you know how great our political system works? Just look at, you know. <laughs> Think how great the economic system works. Oh, and our education systems don't have any problems, do they? People are wanting to try something different. There's this apocryphal quote that's attributed to Einstein. No one can find where he said it. But, you know, it's one of these kind of, it's, it's very brilliant. And so people, you know, it's a story about Einstein. He had colleagues when he was at the Institute for Advanced Research after he had escaped the Nazis. And they brought him a very difficult physics problem they couldn't solve. And the story goes, he said, well, I'm busy now. Leave it on the, leave it on the table. Come back the next day. Do you have any advice, any insight? The quote, you can find it on the internet, some version of this, says, well, sometimes you have to remember, you can't always solve problems with the same kind of thinking that created them. As bad as the problems are that we face today, 
I am not going to attribute those problems to Osage philosophy or worldviews or Delaware or Potawatomi or Anishinaabe or Passamaquoddy. Why don't we try listening to what indigenous people can share about intellectual traditions, cultural traditions, worldviews, philosophies that might give us a way to solve a problem that they didn't make, but they are on the front lines of the receiving end. Let's do that. So that's good news. That's really, really good news for us to think about. So how do you, you, so, you know, I've got great scholars here in front of me who I respect and, you know, scholars don't like to make bold generalizations, but I do because <laughs> I work at Haskell Indian Nations University. By the way, a shout out for Haskell. We have one of the incredible, you know, talk about a treasure. You guys have the United Nations of American Indian Higher Education. I didn't get this out of a textbook. I didn't get this, you know. Nothing I'm saying is original. I'm just reporting out what I have learned after being so fortunate of being at Haskell now for 31 years. What I've learned from the aunties and uncles and some of my students' grandparents and some of those leaders that have now started their journey to the stars. Bill Tallboy, Ted Rising Sun, Albert Whitehat, Oscar Coagley. Incredible people, wisdom holders. And so although we don't like to make generalizations, I'm gonna make a few because when we have these discussions at Haskell, it seems like there are these things we get. When you get Indians together, as Don Fixico used to say when he was here at KU, you know, when you get Indians together and we start talking, there are things we just get, you know, it doesn't, we understand. So if you want to try a different worldview, think about this. First time I heard this stated explicitly was by Warren Lyon. Onondaga, uh, wisdom holder among the Haudenosaunee. What's the difference between the way we look out there and what we see and what scientists who come to visit with us about our water, about our forest, about our animals? He says when they come to talk to us, they tell us we should better manage our resources. And we remind them we have no resources. We live among relatives. This, is, gets, this gets into this thing that Robert had mentioned about notions of personhood. Notions of personhood, notions of kinship. There's a reason why in many of our tribal traditions our clan system that we take as part of who we are and identifying us are features of the natural world. It's like that's not a normal. It's reminding us of a kinship that we have. There's nothing romantic about this. This is modern ecology, right? We know that. We are all connected. Evolution would tell us we're all related. Let's move from thinking about resources to thinking about what it would mean if we could reframe the problems, issues we have in terms of relatives. If we do that, then we can make another giant step forward. We can quit this preoccupation with right. Don't get me wrong, indigenous people understand the importance of rights as much as any people on the planet. But they understand rights are completely bankrupt, in fact, corrupt and quite dangerous, if not counterbalanced by what the water protectors have been telling us now. We are there not because it's our right. We are there because it's our inalienable responsibility to be there. The third thing I'd suggest is we're all tired. I am. I'm, I'm kind of suffering sustainability fatigue. I, everyone's talking about sustainability. I, I'm, and I know words, you know, take on life's 
of their own. Again, we know that too. It's indigenous people, and I don't know people who, who value words more than indigenous people and put great stock on that. But I think one of the things that we should start thinking about is let's do like the water protectors. When everyone wants to see us as negative against something, against progress, let's take the attitude of relatives, the importance of responsibilities, and let's tell them that what we're advocating is nothing more than the promotion of systems of life enhancement on the planet. Not the just us notion, meaning humans, but a justice that thinks about that larger kinship and political and moral sphere we are a part of, that is the land, that is the air, that is the water. Now, some people might say, oh, there, see, that's the romanticism. Let's be careful. No, I'll tell you what romanticism is. Romanticism are Fortune 500 corporations that still think we're in charge. They literally think they're in charge, that they're in control. Talk about a romantic notion, an unrealistic view of our place on the planet. The planet is telling us constantly, you're not in charge. Behave yourself. You still have an opportunity to learn, to embody uh, whether or not we're going to become a mature species or an extinct species. So uh, anyway, thank you very much. And thank you all for being here. surrounded by, if we, if we bother to look, that is, um, over the, at least the past couple of months, if not the past um, six or seven months or so. So um, having already heard from several experts, um, I, I really just like to start with, uh, by no noting the media blackout over the past several months that really only tapered off, what, into October? Mm -hmm. It was just a few days ago that a uh, major uh, news outlet sent the first journalists they could um, up to Standing Rock to get first-hand experience and first-hand reporting. I think that was uh, just this last week by CNN. So uh, given that blackout, you know, much of the sort of mainstream um, non-indigenous reporting on this issue has come from independent or alternative news sources. Um, Democracy Now!, Unicorn Riot, we've had a few others mentioned. Um, Many of these are decentralized media collectives, right? They're already reflecting uh, what eventually over time, and that many of us have seen in our Facebook feeds or something like that, uh, are really indigenous ways of understanding the circulation of information. So otherwise, you've probably seen images like this. You've, you've seen Shailene Woodley or Bernie Sanders wearing the Stand with Standing Rock t-shirt. Please do not buy this t-shirt. Uh, unless you're getting it from a source that's, that's donating money, uh, that's donating funds, proceeds to Standing Rock. Uh, but we've been sort of inundated with these kind of images. I think the point is, much of what we have seen thus far has been um, probably work by non-Indigenous allies. 
Indigenous media practices, on the other hand, uh, the kind of news and, and activist media, uh, the digital art that circulates through our social media reflect not just a spirit of resistance, but, uh, but a media practice that is embedded, is deeply rooted in indigenous knowledge. And that's something different entirely, right? And these, generally speaking, these practices are seeking to make visible uh, a certain kind of narrative about neocolonial development. So this ecosystem of media that we have experienced thus far with Standing Rock uh, should be seen as part of a larger history of relations between indigenous media makers and mainstream non-indigenous settler media in the United States and Canada, which have always had a stake in the representation of indigenous resistance uh, to resource extraction. This is part of these romantic notions that we've been sort of um, batting around here. Media outlets like Indian Country Today or alternative sources like News from Indian Country, Native News Online, uh, Red Power Media, these reflect a diversity of indigenous responses to these power structures. In the last decade has seen a surge in environmental action by organizations like the Indigenous Environmental Network, Honor the Earth, Indigenous Rising, and this is the one of the one of several logos for the I Don't Know More movement over the past five years or so. All of these organizations are not only concerned with environmental stewardship, but are at least partly concerned with the relationship between media technologies and envir environmental stewardship. So just to give a little bit of media context for those of you that, uh, that maybe weren't really aware of, of this sphere of media uh, back in 2012, when I Don't Know More exploded at the end of 2012, what it became was a grassroots network uh, largely for resisting environmental projects, corporate environmental projects, much like we're seeing right now. Uh, the Keystone XL, which many of you probably have heard about, the Enbridge Northern Gateway on Ida Land, uh, fracking projects across the continent. And this laid the groundwork for today's resistance to the Kinder Morgan pipeline expansion, the Sandpiper expansion, and the Dakota Access project. And I think it's important to note that Dakota Access is one among many. Every time one gets shut down, we just had good news about the Sandpiper, another one pops right up, right? And the story is much the same. I don't know more was you can't see these images terribly well, but I don't know more, was partly defined or at least heavily shaped eventually by its media practices, by its sort of public uh, visual persona, its methods of mobilizing through social media, uh, its online mapping platforms. This is a map that came out in 2012 to both um, organize certain resistance as well as uh, express solidarity among groups that were working at the local level. Uh, and as well as the memes and other visual content that circulated as part of I Don't Know More. So in this way, artists and activists are intervening in dominant discourses of energy development, whether at the level of cartography or art, and I'll, as I'll show you in a moment. Standing Rock, uh, by contrast, has been defined even more by uh, crowdfunding projects, you've probably seen these circulating, uh, locative media, <coughs> Facebook check-ins, which uh, have worked as a tool for mobilization and solidarity, but also, of course, for police surveillance. That's the double edge of social media, I suppose. Uh, drone footage, you, you really can't see this, but if you caught this over uh, Thanksgiving week, this was the drone footage um, that captured one of the last uh, major conflicts that occurred, in which uh, there were several injuries, life-threatening injuries, as well as streaming video from the front lines that's been mentioned through Facebook. Live. This is a Facebook Live update from Dallas Goldtooth, who is now affiliated with the Indigenous Environmental Network. So Facebook Live became widespread in April, not coincidentally, right about the same time that um, Standing Rock youth were beginning to organize uh, against Dakota Access. Uh, Myron Dewey from Digital Smoke Signals, as well as Dallas Goldtooth, these uh, two individuals and many others. But um, have been ever present via Facebook Live. And Digital Smoke Signals, Myron Dewey has, uh, they have been shooting drone footage um, over the last several months. So this, this particular uh, type of, of video footage presents us with a different perspective on what's going on, right? We have Facebook Live footage from the front lines, a very immediate, visceral experience, 
remote experience of what's going on at Standing Rock, and we have this particular perspective of the black snake, the path of the black snake, trapped in food web. So collectively, these media practices collapse space and time. This is part of the shift that's happened over the past 10, 10 or so years. And this facilitates the spread of information under heavy censorship and surveillance. Uh, but they also provide, again, these sort of immediate experiences, uh, and particularly immediate experiences of militarized settler violence. Facebook Live differs from other social video platforms, such as, say, Snapchat. Um, ironically, Facebook Live, given its, uh, <coughs> its particular format, it encourages not really viral circulation, but it encourages us to look at length at these images not just view and share, right? With a Facebook Live post, you have to participate with the, uh, with the footage for a few moments to actually experience what you're seeing. So beyond this sphere, indigenous artists are mobilizing these same approaches through video and digital art, including some KU and Haskell students and alumni, one of them being Myron Dewey. This is from his uh, short documentary, Protectors of the Sacred, it's another uh, Haskell alum and KU student, um, Charlie Perry, whose documentary we screened uh, several weeks ago. So I would uh, like to just show, really just show you a couple of the sort of, the visual culture of Standing Rock as it has developed over the last uh, several months. From several different indigenous artists. Some of these are uh, digital work, some are woodcuts. Y'all can read this in the back. We have a relation in the house, Marty Kubel. His cartoons are excellent, by the way. I should check them out. One of my favorites. <laughs> several images from Greg Deal uh, whom we had out to Lawrence uh, several weeks ago as well. As you can see, some of these uh, images are designed as memes just for mere circulation. Uh, they're designed to be interventions into certain kind of discourses like the We Can Sue It image. And this is, uh, this particular image, like many, are really just designed um, for mobilization, organizational purposes. So what I'd, I'd just like to do with uh, my last comments is um, I would like to track out a couple of indigenous media theorists. As we read, we talk about reading indigenous media, we're really talking about reading it potentially, right, from a non-indigenous and especially romanticized point of view. Um, the, and I'm glad uh, that uh, the role of indigenous women in uh, both I Don't Know More and Standing Rock uh, was sort of brought to mind because the, the earliest development of this, um, of the indigenous media theory that I think really is most important and most significant to what's going on today starts with um, native women in the uh, 80s and 90s, right, that are developing a certain kind of documentary film practice. Marjorie Bocage, who wrote, the rhythm of the drumbeat and the language of smoke signals can be transformed to the airways and modems of our time. It's a bit dated now, right? But the point still stands. Uh, this particular approach of Bocage really forecasts Myron Dewey's approach in digital smoke signals. That is, quickly integrating new media technologies into their work. Filmmakers Loretta Todd and Barry Barclay ground their work in what they call subversive acts of sovereignty where the aesthetics of such acts actually reside in the indigenous positionality as much as they do indigenous knowledges. The relationship to environment and language, a relational framework. Moving ahead in time, Mohawk multimedia artist Jackson Two Bears adopts an approach to new media that recognizes the animated spirit in technology which is best mobilized in service of a spiritual ecology. He warns against the consequences of ignoring, and I like this quote from him, 
the animate essence of technicity that has been present from new media all the way through um, earlier forms of media, right? Before the new. Stephen Locke argues for an indigenous media cosmology as a model rooted in the histories, traditions, knowledge, and communication systems of indigenous people, which actualizes according to an evolving relational framework and recognizes the agency of other species. Finally, Candace Hopkins and Jason Lewis argue for media and technology development that operates itself on indigenous epistemological protocols, right down to the code right down to the code, build it again from the bottom up. This extends to the way content is shared through social media platforms embedded with neoliberal values. It also coincidentally positions an indigenous critique of those same technologies. How to use Twitter to its most uh, organizational effects toward resistance, while at the same time critiquing the system through which it is constructed as a new media technology built upon neoliberal ideals. The goal here being to develop new technologies that are rooted in an alternate ethic of knowledge production, social interaction, and environmental responsibility. So I'm uh, a little upset that you can't read this, mostly because, oh, by the way, if anybody's interested, it's not available for your iPhone yet, but if you use an Android phone, the Add Only More app, you should get this. Uh, but in any case, I also have a list of, uh, if anybody would like to have uh, a list of either organizations to follow and donate to, these specifically will link to, as well, to crowdfunding campaigns that are worth uh, your time and money. The Sacred Stone Camp, the Chet and Shakalin Camp, Standing Rock Sioux Tribe, Red Warrior Camp, and then several of the uh, environmental action organizations that I mentioned earlier, Honor the Earth, Indigenous Environmental Network, and so on. I don't know more is still running, uh, as well as the North Apple Solidarity Group. Indigenous media organizations to look for. Heard so much about fake news in the last week and a half, right? Need to be careful what we read. And then on top of that, I, I really had to add this in. I've seen so many t-shirts, and in fact, I'm wearing one of them. Um, but I've seen so many t-shirts over the past month and a half. Um, I, it's important to know where, where you're getting what you buy to represent and stand up for standing rock. So these two indigenous clothing companies specifically donate their proceeds for their uh, standing rock t-shirts and other merchandise and paraphernalia to um, camps at standing rock. That's all I have, thanks a lot. Um, my name is Sierra Tibbles. I am also a woman who helps her people. And I come here in a good handshake, and it's really good to be here. Um, so, uh, as introduction says, I am um, from Lakota and from the Ogawa Sioux Tribe on the Pioneer Canadian Reservation in South Dakota. Okay. 
So, I have a bone screen. I just threw this together with all my pictures. Um, I've been up there twice. I'll be spending the night, or this night and camp twice. And um, helped out with the deliveries of supplies. Okay, so, um, as I was saying, um, I am a high school alum, so all, most of my knowledge on uh, treaties and the history came from Dr. Wildcat and Dr. Anderson. And so, Standing Rock, this is the entrance here. Uh, see, uh, this is a picture probably back in September, but uh, last time I was there, Sitting Bull. I wish I got a better picture with all the flags there. But me was showing water slide. like speaking on my own experience and my own journey. I know everyone has their own experiences and so I'm not an expert really. I'm just trying to <laughs> explain that without getting so emotional. <laughs> Listening to everyone before me, you know, it's it was kind of triggering because you, know, you just really have to be there in person because you see this very powerful being there, the, the movement, the collective, people coming together. And, you know, it's not just tribal nations. You know, at one point we were, some of us were enemies. <laughs> and, you know, just seeing us, seeing everyone come together is so powerful. And seeing all the non natives too come and working together, you know, I, it's something I haven't seen before. And at least in my lifetime, I have. Our relatives who, you know, were a part of the American Indian movement okay, before I was born, and so this is something unique to be a part of. And so this picture here, uh, I don't know if anyone can see in the back. It's just uh, I captured this with all the women um, cooking um, and everyone. Uh, this is after the prayer. You can see the flags in the back. Um, this here is uh, this was the day after. If anyone followed along back in September around Labor Day weekend, is one of the first uh, first attacks happened on the people um, with the with the attack dogs and the mace, and um, I don't think a lot of media reported besides you know the people on Facebook were that but that's, that's a place where um, the Mkwapa relatives, the uh, our, our ancestors were buried, and I think that was a tactic. I mean, from my own opinion, it was a tactic to lure us and be violent, but we still remained uh, peaceful. So this took place the day after um, that happened, and the, um, we're praying there. And this is a, uh, as uh, Dr. Wildcat said, it was led. It's pretty much led by women. You know, we are the backbone, backbone of our nation. And just to keep in mind, you know, it's not just Lakota people are there, that are there. It's uh, you know, um, everyone, it's like 566 tribal nations. So <laughs> that's a lot, a lot representing. So a lot of a lot of languages that are being spoken, um, our <coughs> cultural traditions. Uh, this here I captured, I don't know if you guys can see it, but Dennis Bakes was in around this time and he was there doing a speech. And uh, anyone, I don't know if anyone's too familiar with him, but he was part of the Indian movement there and offering and it takes on a story about a uh, about you know reminiscing about his days with the AIM movement and then coming there and seeing it led by not only women but the youth. You know the and that's what really got started with uh, like the them running to DC and and then that's whenever I noticed that DC Shaley would lead and everyone would be uh, becoming more involved. That was back in what August or in the summertime in August. Uh, I just put this on here. Um, this is the second time I went up. This is some of them. This is their first time. This is a collective of the First Nation Student Association members here, uh, and then some. I don't know if some of them are here, but uh, and then also the Black Lives Matter chapter that came with us. We all came together, and um, yeah, we were ready to. Uh, uh, this is probably right before we went on the front lines, so. We have here, like, it's good to see all the solidarity and just uh, the KU and the Union Tony, and got the Dene signs too. Uh, this year I went to Pro because I'm like, um, I've been living here for four years, and so 
I don't really, it's, I don't really go home every all, all the time. So when I am home, you know, I'm just being around the horses. And uh, I took a picture of uh, a young man who was uh, taking care of his horse. And that right there is the Missouri River. This year was taken probably like six o'clock in the morning. It was, it was uh, the teepees and it was after we all prayed by the water. Uh, I think uh, not a lot of that was shown on the media. I mean, just because it's our, our moments of um, prayer and praying for everybody. Um, so this, the, these pictures are more of like what's happening inside the camp. Um, some of the pictures I've taken was either, I mean, you get off Facebook, everyone is already recording at the same time. So. And here is, uh, I can't remember the person's name, whose TV this was, but you can see all the, all the different um, designs of the horses. Um, okay, so I wanted to put this on here because uh, as Dr. Wildcat was saying before, um, and it's something that uh, we've all brought up as students, you know, wishing we could be there all the time. And, you know, me, I felt torn, like, I've, I want to be there every weekend or you know just the whole time and I was told even by my Lakota elders that you know we're here doing what you can when you're here even at KU uh, even in the Lawrence community um, educating people about this and telling the experiences the history that goes into this and why we're doing this and so here this was uh, taking place uh, I don't know if a lot of people have been there but it was the march that happened a while back that uh, did a collaboration with um, uh, the Lawrence community came together and did this march. And um, that right there is the FEMSA member, so majority woman right there. Um, yeah, so the, I wish anyone could ask questions, but. <laughs> why we um, are protesting and and uh, the, the map that you've seen before raises the point that you know the Bismarck they were concerned about their water they moved it towards us seems like a lot of these things that take place they're always uh, moving it towards the reservations or they don't you know like scoot in the side like us that's not our problem now you know so can you and I don't know I want to go back to that map if I can because I want to show you something You see by Stanley, like how it just comes all the way around. Mm -hmm. And you would think that it would just go straight, kind of like by Fort Berthold and all the way. People ask why, why that's the way it is. Like how come it just didn't stay on this side? But it's like, it's like either way, you know, it's still gonna impact us. And uh, even though that it's like a half a mile away from the reservation line, it's still like, as we were mentioning before, it's treaty, it's treaty lines. I mean, even though it's this imagina imaginary border, <laughs> and it's ridiculous when people argue that, you know, even though it's not on the reservation, it's like, well, it's going under the river. It's, I mean, and it's gonna trickle down all the way to here in Lawrence. Um, and then that's why people probably don't get why it's such a, it matters to everybody, even in Kansas City, it's going all the way down. Um, I don't know how much time do I have left. So I just wanted to raise that. It's like very important. Like it's Next time someone wants to argue with you on that, <laughs> it's gonna trickle down. Oh, here, I don't know where you got this at, but I was amazed how you put all that in my language. Awesome, you got you got in translation. That's a big river, muddy river here. And anyone ever interested? Like Minnesota, it's actually <laughs> a Lakota word, Dakota word actually. And you got. Zuzetra Safa, that's black snake. But yeah, uh, well, I wish I could talk.
talk more about everything in the depth, but we don't have enough time for that, so. Uh, I'll just wait till the questions come and then answer that. Well, thank you everybody, we'll do a thumbs up how you. Yeah. She's asking about like, you know, the consent that they, you know, they, right. the public, the public, uh, I guess, say were invited to, um, to have a say so, just like Bismarck was invited to. But from my understanding, what I heard is that if you put it in the newspaper, hey, we're having this project yeah. development, it's going to happen, and you're all invited to your opinion. Well, that's considered legal of public forum. They had their chance to have their input that we don't want it there. Well, you know, if that's that's the only invite they get, then, you know, how do they know? It could be right. just some new mall building up in Bismarck or something, you know, a new road or something. So that's, um, that's kind of how they're waiting to weasel their way in there. Yeah, if any of you have been following the good social media stuff on the uh, 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 frack free New Mexico and the Chaco Canyon, anti-fracking movement, there's really awesome work going on in New Mexico right now. But I think they've exposed sort of what happened in North Dakota and, and have been working very hard not to make it happen uh, in New Mexico. So two things. The first thing is that uh, let's make it clear that putting a public notice uh, up in a, in a newspaper is not what is required by treaties and by federal law when it means that you must work directly on a nation-to-nation -nation basis. We don't, you know, put in the New York Times an article about we're going to have a meeting to do a treaty with Mexico and expect them to show up. It's ludicrous. But that's exactly the way tribes are treated. And then the second thing is, we saw this in the South Lawrence traffic way, is, as Jay reminded me, is when they often have public hearings, the public hearings turn out to be the Army Corps of Engineers gets, gets up, engineers get up and tell you what they're going to do. And then when you start saying, well, wait a second, we'd like to question, well, no, 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 here's a form, you can write down your comments and we'll get back to you. That is, that, that is the kind of misrepresentation of, you know, this consultation and, and advisement that is supposed to, to go on that often doesn't and, and when it comes to tribal nations. Any other questions? 
I have one. Um, I don't know if I need that or not. Hello. <laughs> I'm Carol Burns, and I have a question for whoever can answer it. Um, this is for whoever may not uh, know much about tribal law and politics, but what's preventing uh, the tribes from exercising uh, derived eminent domain themselves? I think probably the, the, the main thing that's, that's limiting it is that um, there's probably a, a fear that by doing so, um, they're going to be dragged into litigation that's going to be very costly and very timely. Uh, it, it'll be a drag on, on their resources. And so I think often what they're thinking about is how can we, you know, confront the kinds of infringements that we're facing, you know, uh, short of going to court. The courts have not been friendly in the last two decades on tribal issues, and there are a number of tribes now that have actually pulled back from taking things to court for fear that they might create a precedent then that would affect all tribes. And so there really is, you know, uh, um, this legal aspect of it that's going on now is quite fascinating. But my reading of it is, if you ask, if you ask, you know, uh, Chairman Archambault, he'd say, um, "Well, that's great, but you know, who, who's going to do the work? How are we going to, you know, are we going to be spread even thinner on the battles that we're trying to fight?" So I think it's just, it's just a question of, of, of strategic kind of, kind of. Uh, it's just a question of strategy. So that would be my take on it. I've never talked to Chairman Archambault about that, but I, I, I wonder if that might not be the, be the thinking. I have heard people like Walter Echo Hawk and Dave Wilkins talk about the climate in the, in the uh, federal courts now towards tribes, and they don't look at it as being particularly favorable. And so you do have tribes that have things that they probably should fight, but they're afraid of what decision they might get that then would be used as a precedent against all tribes. Thank you. Um, I think One of the major um, kind of issues that is brought up with stand the standing rock and any kind of thing where people are asked to show allyship is the definition of allyship. It is not a self proclamation, it is something where you're supposed to work in cooperation with the people whom you're supposed to be allying with. And I like that. I think it was Dr. Romano brought up in his presentation about, um, you know, be mindful of where you're purchasing these shirts from. Is your allyship actually benefiting the people that you're trying to ally with? And I, I feel like most people's intentions are in the right place and a lot of people want to help, but when there's, I, mean, I guess I'm just trying to ask for everybody, is, are there other common pitfalls such as the, you know, getting t-shirts through um, non-donating to sources which people could kind of be led astray from um, standing and standing up? So I'm not exactly sure on the t-shirts and stuff, but I can comment on, um, I just got back there. I got back last night. I've been there for three weeks um, working. And when it comes to allyship, I um, so I had this conversation because I, I went to the elders meeting. They have elders meetings every day or every, uh, every other day. And um, they pretty much keep you grounded on this is a pre peaceful prayer because there are so many radicals people that are so angry, you know, there's so many allies, it's not, it's just, there's so many people there. I think this past week there was like 10,000 just in the area, you know, and um, it's bringing, it's, it's an econo economic boom over there, but at the same time, you know, they're, they're, if you look like you're in, you're from camp, they're not going to sell things in Bismarck, they won't sell things to you. Now that their people are weatherizing their things, they're not selling propane to people, they're not selling, so these, so now it's actually depend. people are starting to become a little bit more dependent on on people who care and bringing supplies up and then that's when they stop it. They're like, oh, we're gonna have, you know, a thousand dollars for 
a fine if you're bringing supplies, which today just um, it came out that it's, it's, they're not gonna do that anymore. Um, but they are racial profiling. And, um, and I actually, the day before I left, I ran into this lady and she, um, she was a, a white lady and she just came in. She's like, hey, let's put our, micro our, let's put our phones in the microwave. I don't want nobody to hear this because I don't want them to understand, you know, because you just came back from there. And it is true. They, they're probably tracking you right now. They're probably listening to me right now. I can't even, I, I swear, they, 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 to post on my own page, because I posted from the front lines, and to post on my own page, they said that, okay, your post has been submitted, but now um, we're, we're, it's pending approval. To post on my own page, you know, the admin is, is going to approve it. So they had to approve everything after that, after I posted on the front line. So they're... they're Facebook, yes, okay. I have a picture of it if you guys want to okay. see it, it's a okay. screenshot, and um, I couldn't believe it, and they have blackout medias, you know, where I've never, they have Wi-Fi on the hill, we call it Facebook Hill, right? Everybody goes up there and they post and they can talk to their family and they have Wi-Fi, but if you actually, like, connect, then the, your, your phone will just start going blank every once in a while, especially when there's action going on, and you turn on your phone and it'll just turn right back off. So, um... I'll watch. So the, uh, okay, so she came. Sorry. So she came and she was like, "Oh, we're gonna go to the cemetery." So we put our phones in there. And she's like, "It's gonna block the waves. It's gonna, you know." <laughs> so then she's like, "No, we're gonna go and we're gonna dig up. We're gonna go dig up in the graves. Let's go and this and that because that's exactly what they're doing to you guys." And oh my goodness! And I'm like, "Whoa, you know, Whoa. hey, I love your passion. Hey, babe, like you know, you're awesome." But um, at the same time, no, I was like, "You can't. You cannot do that." That's exactly what they want. This is exactly how you're gonna, and I was on the front lines and they were, they were saying, hey, if anybody's yelling at the cops, if anybody's out there and they're saying F you or doing anything, you know, bad, they're an infiltrator. You need to kick them out. So I had, to, I had to tell two guys, I was like, hey, you guys need to stop that. I'm gonna go get my brothers and they're gonna kick you out because they're gonna think you're an infiltrator. And they're like, oh, oh, okay, you know, and they, they chilled out, but like, you have to take things so serious. And when you come into that space, like, this is a peaceful thing. This is not, you know, bad. I mean, it's a bad situation, but it's not, um, it doesn't have to be, you know? I just, I want to, I mean, I, I appreciate all the allies, but you know, you can't go out there and expect to just fight, fight, you know, because of white privilege or something, you know, like, oh, they're not going to do it to me. I don't look in the end, you know, but <laughs> they're going to do it to everybody. I mean, I have, I will, I'll tell you, just because I have one of the rubber bullets that, that they're shooting at people. If you guys want to see it, this wow. is one of the rubber bullets that I didn't get hit with directly, but it ricocheted and hit me. So I picked it up because I wanted to share this story with people. I, this is this is what they're shooting. Yeah, and now you know they're actually you know everybody has Custer has his scouts. You know he has his native scouts, and I heard a story yesterday from one of my best friends that's actually from Cannonball. She's a she went to Haskell, and that's where I met her. And, we linked back up there and we just started, she's, she goes to Bismarck and her aunt works at one of the schools there in Cannonball. And you know, just, just within the school system, they're not allowed to talk about it. These people are not allowed to talk about it. They can't talk about it in school. They can't talk about it anywhere. They're shameful. These kids are getting bullied big time. All these elementary kids, kids are getting bullied immensely for being native. If they even smell like smoke, the teachers are like, ew. They mm -hmm. smell like smoke. They probably didn't even take a shower. You know, like just bullied. It, this is not even being talked about. And another thing is like, they have somebody there. They There was a room full of cops in a hotel. They're targeting hotels now because now the people that are getting cold are like, okay, we're gonna go shower, we're gonna stay in Bismarck, or we're gonna, you know. They have infiltrators, that native, native infiltrators are probably paying them tons of money. And they'll be, they'll, put alcohol on them and they're not wanting to be drunk and they'll be like, hey, um, can I borrow ten dollars? I'm a protester. And like the first thing you know, you we're not protesters. That's the first thing they say. We are not protesters, we are protectors. So for someone to say that and then they he said his name and he couldn't even say it, couldn't spell it. They knew he was an infiltrator. And they're just trying to make the Native Americans there look bad. And this is the stuff that is not being told. There's so many strategies. There's so many things that are happening bam, bam, one after another, that is affecting these people. And I just wanted to share that. So sorry, it's for taking all the time. <laughs> things that aren't really being 
being covered. I know some people are private messaging this video, talking about it, and I've had a few friends that have gone over, gone up there that have come back and shared about the helicopters and planes that are flying over at night, um, and how that particular area is being um, possibly sprayed and with things going on. Would you care to comment on that or what you saw while you were up there for three weeks? So as far as the planes, everybody talks about it. There's drones constantly. Um, before I left, actually, the planes stopped because of the weather. I mean, they um, they have planes that are going over, and there no, there's no lights. You can just hear them, and then you look up, and they're there, constantly going on. Constant planes, just through all throughout the night, just nonstop, 24/7. When we just laugh at it, we're like, hey, you know, how many millions of dollars are they spending on that one plane just to be here? And you know, there's rumors. I have no idea what, what they're putting on it, but we know on the, our solar panels, there's this film. You know, there's a certain film that, you know, you go on there, it's kind of greasy. It's kind of, you know, there's, there's rumors that they're, they're purposely putting things on people that make them aggressive, because that's what they want. They want you to be aggressive. They want you to fight, they want you to do this. So that was one of the rumors. Another one is the infrared light, so they can see you better at nighttime. Um, another one was so they can hear, you know, they can, you can get reception. Now you can get better reception. When I first went down there, I couldn't get reception at all. <clears throat> and now I can call from my car. You know, I don't have to go on Facebook to call my mom or anything. So, um, but there's just all kinds of rumors. Does anybody else have anything to say about it? Because I'm not sure what they're doing with the planes, but it is true, it's constant. Like, I don't know if it's just the, to drive you crazy from hearing the plane noise, but they're constantly, they were. But when I left, they stopped. Um, but yeah, and then they turned on their lights eventually, like probably like last week, that's when they started putting on their lights. But because of the weather, they stopped flying around. So we're gonna take one more question because we're running out of time, and I know you have been waiting. I've actually got two questions. One is in the 60s, there were laws passed to prevent highways from going predominantly to poor neighborhoods and uh, ethnic neighborhoods. Is there any way that could be applied for this pipeline, seeing they pushed it down to the Indian Reservation or just above it? And the second one I had is we had a discussion with a friend in Minot up there in North Dakota yesterday, and she said their news is just full of everything evil going on up there, how how the state house has been defaced and, and several other terrible things, and I was wondering if I could hear anything about that from this side. I can't answer the specific questions on that. I guess I, just in general, I hear Trina speak and hearing the questions people have, having my own questions just from watching social media and other things. I mean, I think it's a great time to figure out, um, first of all, to if you want to do something to find people that, that you know you can trust to help you get resources to where they need to go. Uh, you know, I keep hearing about propane, and it sounds like something. You know, I think a, you know, um, a um, people sending propane instead of uh, their kids may be a better thing to do right now, right? <laughs> Especially at this time. I've been up in that part of the world in late December, and um, it gets pretty cold. And I just think it's a it's a time for pretty uh, tough people um, uh, to be there. And um, but people taking propane, those are things that people really need. It's probably something. Firewood, but firewood. It's illegal, but it's from state to state. But I mean, we can figure it out. Yeah. So, but so find the people who are organizing that kind of action, organizing that kind of action yourself, and find the people that can get it there and help you be in touch with people. But also, I think some of those uh, media organizations that Josh listed, all of those people are operating on shoestring budgets. Mm -hmm. uh, if you if you uh, subscribe to what they do, if you can donate to what they're doing, uh, you can say you can ask the questions that you're asking directly to those uh, media organizations. I know that a lot of the people involved in them have uh, are, are very experienced reporters who have high standards for the kinds of stories that they tell. They know how to source things. They know how to report uh, the news. And, uh, and they're pretty intrepid. And they'll go find that story about what's going on actually up at, at the State House, what's happening on, uh, what's happening in Bismarck. Uh, and, and finding the ways that asking the right questions 
even though you're hundreds of miles away, uh, it, it is really important in, in getting the resources to people who can actually help and making sure those resources get into the hands of the people who are going to be there and who need it is, I think, also really important. I think you've already heard tonight from people who know what's going on and um, puts a little bit of pressure on them to to share their experiences um, and to continue to help organize, but obviously with care. And I think that they will still, uh, that's who I'm gonna turn to um, after tonight, is those people I know who can, who, who can uh, help me get my resources, the things that I wanna do into the hands of people um, who really need them. I think that rumors are dangerous, uh, and I think it's probably terrible having to live in the midst of that situation up there with the rumors floating around and not knowing what's going on. Uh, I think the extent to which I can help uh, not pass along rumors that aren't substantiated I think is important. I think passing on good information that seems solid is, is, is really important at a time like this. I think they're all great questions. They deserve answers. And the only people that can demand answers to them are the people with the questions. And I think it's important that, that people demand those answers from uh, wherever you can. joining us. Um, we do have um, just a couple of things to mention. The link that we posted here um, is a link to a guide that libraries has put together that has um, a variety of information, some of which was talked about tonight. We'll be adding additional links um, to that that has information about how you can support um, those at Standing Rock and has links about donation. Um, it has some um, media outlets um, and, and a variety of other things there. So um, if you're interested in doing more, feel free to check this out um, and, and more will be continued to be posted there. Um, and um, the, um, we'll also post that on, on the Facebook event page so that folks can find it later as well. Uh, and I wanted to just mention, we do have, um, as we end here this evening, there are plenty of refreshments here up front. Please feel free to avail yourself of those. But there are also action tables that we have set up um, in the back of the room here. Um, and those are places where if you choose to make um, an action tonight to sign a petition, make a donation, or anything like that, uh, we have laptops set up with that information available. And there's also a very large banner set up on the table in the back um, that we'll be sending. And so please feel free to, um, to contribute to that banner as well. Um, and then finally, uh, the First Nation Student Association uh, also has a table in the back where you can continue this conversation uh, with them. So thank you all for coming this evening. One more thing really quick. Thank you all for coming, but I have to plug one more thing. Um, okay, so on the table in the back underneath the Water is Life banner, there are some event surveys. We would love your feedback. Um, that's the only way we can improve and grow. So please grab one. There are pens back there. Once you're done, just leave it on the table. Thank you so much for coming. Have a good evening.